You'll join me in your Bibles, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12, and this evening we will begin in verse 43, and we'll go through chapter 13 and verse 16. In the aftermath of World War I, the devastation and the loss of life were profound. Millions of soldiers died on the battlefields of Europe. And many of these soldiers were never identified. And to honor these fallen heroes, the United States decided to create a memorial that would symbolize all of our unidentified fallen soldiers. On Armistice Day, November 11th, 1921, the United States Congress approved the burial of an unidentified soldier at Arlington National Cemetery. The soldier chosen was one of the many who had died in World War I. His body was exhumed from a cemetery in France. It was brought back to the United States where it would be interred with honor. Now, this ceremony was held with great reverence. The unidentified soldier was laid to rest beneath a marble tomb, which would come to be known as the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. The tomb is adorned with an inscription that says, Here rests in honored glory an American soldier known but to God. It became a powerful symbol of remembrance, not only for World War I, but for all American soldiers who have died in military service. A sentinel from the 3rd United States Infantry Regiment, also known as the Old Guard, stands watch over the tomb 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, rain or shine, ensuring that the memory of these fallen soldiers is preserved for all future generations. Each year, on Memorial Day and Veterans Day, ceremonies are held at the tomb where wreaths are laid, tributes are paid to those who served. It stands as a testament to the collective memory of a nation, ensuring that the sacrifices of those who have fought for their country are never forgotten. And as we continue looking through the book of Exodus, we arrive at this final extended description of the Passover instituted by God for the people of Israel. And we are instructed on the importance of remembrance. Every culture has various remembrances, ceremonies for important events or people or sacrifices. The Passover is no exception, and it's one of the foundational biblical remembrances that carries into the new covenant in the Lord's Supper. In our text, God instructs the Israelites to remember that they're, uh, remember their liberation from slavery in Egypt. He emphasizes the significance of passing down the story of their deliverance to the future generations, ensuring that the, the memory of their suffering, and more importantly, what God did for them to lead them to their freedom, remain alive. The Israelites are commanded to observe the Passover, making the night when the angel of death passed over their homes, sparing them from the last plague that struck Egypt. This act of remembrance is, is vital for preserving their identity as a people who were chosen by God. It is a foundational narrative of their faith and their heritage. Remembrance is a means of protecting, preserving identity and, and honoring sacrifices. It's good to have national and family remembrances. It's why we celebrate anniversaries and we celebrate as a nation things like Independence Day or the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, the Vietnam Memorial. It's why we celebrate birthdays or even Christmas and Easter. Remembrance. Well, the Bible emphasizes the importance of remembrance extensively. The, the word remember in this context of remembering something appears over 200 times throughout the Bible. 
The command is particularly significant in the context of God's relationship toward his people, as it often serves as a a reminder to reflect on his past deeds and his blessings and the covenant that God has established with us. In Hebrew, the, the imperative that means to remember is mentioned more than 25 times as a direct command specifically to the people of God. Forgetting what God has done the blessings that have accompanied his action has, has often and can lead to spiritual neglect and apathy. And we see the reality of that all throughout the Old Testament with the Israelites. But remembering, remembering fosters faith. It increases our thankfulness. We are encouraged to reflect on our history, the lessons that have been learned by the people of God and the work that God has guided through triumph and trials. Remembering, especially for the Christian, it's not merely an act of nostalgia. It serves to educate future generations about history, about our great God, and about all that he has done to liberate his people from the tyranny of sin and death. So as we take a final look at the institution of the Passover, we're going to look at three ways that this text calls us to remember. So let's read the text together and we will see what we are to remember. Exodus 12, beginning in verse 43. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money, may eat of it after you have circumcised him. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven eaten for seven days. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute as it's appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come, your son asks you, what does this mean? You shall say to him, by a strong hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. 
For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlet between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Well, let's explore three ways that we can see that the Lord is calling us to remember. And the first is this, that we must remember to commune with God. The Lord gives very clear instructions here. They reveal the very exclusive nature of this Passover meal. Notice the passage begins in verse 43 of chapter 12 with the Lord saying, this is the statute. And Moses repeats that later. The Lord is saying, do it this way. It wasn't to be treated as a buffet or a potluck. It was a specific meal to be given to a specific people and it was to be presented in a specific way. Notice how often we read in this text, no foreigner shall eat of it. No hired worker may eat of it. Let no uncircumcised person eat of it. And then we see this contrast. If a, if a slave bought for money is to eat of it, he must be circumcised. If a stranger wants to partake of the Passover, he must be circumcised. Verse 49, there shall be one law for the native and the stranger who sojourns among you. You see, this is a memorial meal for the house of Israel and those who have willingly entered into this covenant with them through circumcision. And that's it. The Passover is exclusive. But not only is it exclusive, it is commanded. The Lord said, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. In verse 47, that wasn't an optional add-on to, to their worship. It was regulated by God. Verse 46, it shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house. You shall not break any of its bones. So as we think about remembering to commune with God, there's, there's three things about this communion to consider. I'm sorry, I don't like giving you a point and then a bunch of subpoints under that, so I'll try to keep it in order for you to organize. But remember to commune with God. That's our, our main point. But there's three things about that. The first is that God's covenant meal is only for his people. This was God's way of establishing a unique remembrance among his people, and it would remain until the new covenant. They have this unique feast. It was just for them. It was just for the people of God. He was distinguishing his people from everyone else, from every other nation. It was a unique privilege because God had blessed them by calling them his own and loving them and rescuing them. So if a man was not circumcised, he wasn't with them, and the Passover was not for him. And so if we think of that in light of the new covenant meal of remembrance and our communion with God, we think of, of course, the Lord's Supper. We learn that there is likewise a meal given by God to his people only for the people of God. The continuity with the proper recipients of God's covenant meal, it is, it is not baptism, as our Pado baptist brethren would assert, but the continuity between Old Testament circumcision and what we see in the New Covenant is still circumcision. But in the New Covenant, it's not about the, the circumcision of the flesh, it's about the circumcision of the heart. And so the question, do you want to come to the Lord's Supper table? Do you want to commune with God? Do you want to commune with his people? You must have a circumcised heart. You must identify with Christ as a result of that through baptism. You must identify with the people of God in membership in his church. Is your heart circumcised? If so, you should make that public by professing your faith in obedience through the waters of baptism. 
And in baptism, are you not identifying with the people of God? And if you are, then become a covenant member with the church, the bride of Christ. You enter into this relationship with God and with his people, and then you can approach the table, and then you can enjoy this memorial meal, this meal that God has instituted solely for his people. The Apostle Paul even warns in 1 Corinthians 11 that anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner is guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. How is it that one could be outside of Christ and ever partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? It's not possible. How can the covenant people know if one has, has been identified as having a circumcised heart? by the outward signs, namely baptism and church membership. It's a, it is a particular meal for those who are part of the visible covenant community of God. And to ignore or to disdain the warnings of Scripture here may result in serious judgment. Paul even punctuates this warning when he writes that it is, this is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. This is a serious command from the Lord. It was in the Passover, and it most certainly is with the Lord's Supper. Well, the second aspect of remembering to commune with God, we see that God establishes the grounds for communion with Him. In the broader teaching on the Passover in Exodus, this text here combined with several that we've already seen previously, the Lord lays out two important things about how he wants his people to observe the Passover. God is concerned with how the meal is eaten, and he's concerned with the regularity of how often the meal should be consumed. Remember, they were instructed to select a lamb without blemish and to sacrifice it. It was to be roasted and eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They were to eat the meal in haste, and it was to become a festival that included various rituals in the days ahead. God called this an everlasting ordinance. Now here in verse 46 of chapter 12, God commands the Israelites saying, it shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of this flesh outside the house. You shall not break any of its bones. God wanted them to remember his protection under the blood of the lamb in each household that he passed over. So each household was to celebrate the meal amongst its family members, just as they did in Egypt. God wasn't just concerned about the Israelite people as a whole. He, he most certainly was, but the whole is made up of individuals and more specifically, of the firstborn of every family. So each family was to remember what God did by showing them mercy. There's a principle here, of course, for us to consider about family worship. We should gather together to talk about the Lord and what he has done, to remember his blessing, to recall what he is doing even now and how he has shown us mercy and how he is loving us as his people. And that family worship then prepares us to, to come together with the people of God in corporate worship. Those, those parts, you see, that's exactly what God is commanding, that all of the parts, each family, each household is celebrating this Passover, and then they come together as a whole to remember God and the great things that he has done. Notice also the instruction to not break the bones of the lamb. Why is that important? Well, this stipulation points forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. In John 19, 36, we learn that none of Jesus' bones were broken at his crucifixion, a unique aspect of Jesus' crucifixion compared to others. The whole Christ was crucified as the Passover lamb so that when we are covered in the blood, everlasting death will not befall us. Every element matters, brothers and sisters. God has a specific way for his people to worship with specific elements. In the Lord's Supper, as we come to the table, he has told us what that is to be. 
We don't get to just substitute whatever we want. We don't get to have Nutter Butter Cookies and Dr. Pepper. The Lord commanded it is to be bread and wine. Now there is a little loophole here. The text says the fruit of the vine. So grape juice is often used because it's from the same fruit as wine. It's (laughs) wine-ish. But the Corinthians were not getting drunk on grape juice. Our confession of faith says wine, because the term fruit of the fruit of the vine and wine, they're synonymous terms. It's just more clear. But the point is, the Lord establishes these elements, not us. We don't get to decide what they're going to be. God has always always, always regulated the way in which his people are to worship him. We don't get to invent our own elements and methods. Finger painting and dramatic skits are not elements of worship you will find anywhere in the Bible, so you shouldn't find them anywhere in the worship service of the church. God is the one who is being worshipped, therefore we ought to worship him in the way that he wants to be worshipped. Notice also God determines the regularity of the observance of the Passover. It was every year on a fixed day. It wasn't just whenever the Israelites decided it was convenient and they had a hankering for some lamb chops. There were times in Israel's history, you'll recall, if you know your Old Testament, that they, they didn't keep the Passover. And what happened to them? Those are the times we see that Israel is in disobedience, when they were worshiping the false gods, when they followed the patterns of the surrounding nations, when this was only one of many acts of rebellion against the Lord. Missing the Passover for the Israelites had significant implications for them. It wasn't just a ritual. It was a meal with God, remembering what he had done and also remembering who they were as the people of God. In Numbers 9, 13, God says, but if anyone who is clean and is not on a journey fails to keep the Passover, that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at its appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. So there were a few provisions we see for when the celebration could be missed, namely if a person was unclean or they were on a journey. But if they, they didn't have legitimate reasons to not celebrate the Passover, the result, the Lord says, was that they were to be cut off. And we will see that happen as we move along further in the book of Exodus. God took this seriously because of what the meal did. It was a reminder, yes, and, and very importantly so. But it was also reinforcing the identity and the unity of the Israelite people. They were communing with God together, not as isolated individuals. These weren't, these weren't to be me and my Bible people. They needed to be reminded in their collective memory of their liberation from tyranny. And remember, it was also in place to teach history, to show the children, look what God did. Eventually, there were going to be children. We'll look at this again in a few moments, but there would be children who who didn't experience the exodus, so how would they know? How were they to remember that which they did not experience themselves? And so the meal was a perpetual reminder to remember a historical event that happened that was significant and was being pointed to by all the elements of this meal. But even more important, it pointed forward to the meal's greater significance, that one day, the Lord would provide the perfect spotless lamb that he himself would sacrifice for his people. And once this lamb was slain, there was no more need for the blood of lambs to be spilt. There was no more need for a Passover meal. Now we celebrate the Lord's Supper, not with the blood of random, imperfect lambs, but with the symbolic blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are told that when we celebrate this supper, as often as we do it, to do it in remembrance of him. 
Same foundational purpose, but it is infused with significantly greater meaning. Now, of course, this raises another good question. What do Paul's words, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, or as often as you do these things, what does that imply about regularity? The Passover, very clear. Every year, this date, make sure you do it. Seems a bit more vague in the Lord's Supper. If the Lord's Supper is an ordinance of the church, as an element of worship, how often should it be observed? Great question. A lot of opinions on this one, so I'm just going to leave it there for you to go and think about. Or you can go on a reform Facebook group and all the 20-year-old guys will tell you exactly what to think. He'll tell you everything you need to know and you will remind you that arguing with him about it means you don't really understand anything. I'm raising a lot of questions here about the Lord's Supper, about these elements of worship, and about God's instruction in all of this. So, they're good things for us to think about. They are things that Christians debate about. So, I was gone all last week, I have a very busy week ahead. Please don't email me all at once. But these are important things for us as the church to think about. They are good questions to ask. When we see something so clearly identified in something like the Passover in the Old Testament, and we see its relationship to the Lord's Supper in the New Testament, how do those principles carry over? What the elements are, the specificity of them, the regularity of it. Those are good things. We can think more about those. Well, moving along, the third aspect of remembering our communion with God is that communion and remembrance are inseparable realities. When we are communing with God, we are in large part remembering what he has done. We're recalling the mercy that he has shown us. We are thanking God for blessing us. We are delighting in the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ who lived and died for us that we might have everlasting life. We remember what the Lord has done. We are recalling the promises of God and what he has told us he will do. We are remembering the truth of his word. This is why when we come to the Lord's Supper table to commune with God and to commune with his people through this means of grace, we, we explain that we are looking back to what Christ has done. And by virtue of that, and by virtue of Christ's spiritual presence in the elements, we are experiencing a present communion with him, and we are called to remember that God has promised a, a future reality of a great wedding feast with him and all of his people throughout all of time. This is at the heart of what Jesus tells us and what the Apostle Paul highlights, that we are to do this in remembrance of him. Our communion with God and our remembrance are inseparable realities. It's why we see this imperative so often throughout the scriptures. Remember, don't forget. Now, of course, we, we can all understand that the Israelites could have still done just as the Lord commanded in the Passover, everything exactly how he has said it, and yet still be far from God. Going through the motion, Doing the thing doesn't automatically equate to faithfulness and true communion with God in the same way that we understand that the act in itself of partaking the Lord's Supper does not equate to faithfulness and true communion with God. Communion is far more significant than having the word of truth in our heads. It must abide and overwhelm our hearts. John Owen's book, Communion with God, I really encourage you to read that. It's tremendously helpful in thinking through this important reality. We cannot miss it, brothers and sisters. We cannot miss it. We can remember historical facts. We can remember theological truths. We can remember biblical passages. We can remember the answer to our catechism questions. But what are we doing with that information? John Owen gets straight to the heart. He writes this, what am I the better if I can dispute that Christ is God, but have no sense or sweetness in my heart from hence, that he is a God in covenant with my soul. 
what will it avail me to evince by testimonies and arguments that he has made satisfaction for sin if through my unbelief the wrath of God abides on me and I have no experience of my own being made righteous of God in him. If I find not in my standing before God the excellency of having my sin imputed to him and his righteousness imputed to me. Will it be any advantage to me in the issue to profess and dispute that God works the conversion of a sinner by the irresistible grace of his spirit if I was never acquainted experientially with the deadness and utter impotency to do good? That opposition to the law of God that is in my own soul by nature with the efficacy of the exceeding greatness of the power of God in quickening, enlightening, and bringing forth the fruit of obedience in me? It is the power of truth in the heart alone that will make us cleave to it, indeed, in an hour of temptation. Brothers and sisters, we should regularly plead with God to help us have a true experiential acquaintance with him and with his truth and with his promises. Just as real as the Israelites were passed over and spared from death, we too have been spared from death and the penalty of sin. Just as real as God was with the Israelite people, watching over them, protecting them, providing for them, so too he dwells amongst his people today in the Holy Spirit and in the church and in the elements that he has provided. We can have a true felt sense of God's nearness to us as his people. So let us never be content with a mere knowledge of God, brethren. May it be that our hearts are ever longing for more and more of him as he fills our cups to overflowing. Daily, let us take and eat his word in remembrance of him. Daily, let us be in prayer asking God to help us remember the great things that he has done and asking him to do more for his glory and for his people. Daily, let us recall that no matter what comes for us in the world and in our own flesh and from the devil, that God is for us so nothing can be against us. Daily, let us remember that Christ was sacrificed, his blood was shed, his body was nailed to a cross that he could receive the wrath of God for us so that by faith alone in him we can have everlasting life. Remember these great truths, brothers and sisters. And as we do, we will have ever-increasing, joy-filled experiences of communion with our great God. Remember to commune with God. Well, we also see here in this lengthy passage the importance of remembering to obey God. This is a, this is a pivotal moment in the Israelite journey. For over 400 years, they were slaves under the tyranny of Pharaoh, but now it is clear who their real king truly is. It's not Pharaoh. Now they don't have to listen to slave masters any longer. They're no longer in bondage, but they are experiencing true freedom and true liberty, and that calls for true obedience. Unlike Pharaoh, whose only concern was himself and his own legacy and building his own empire, God's concern is his people and his glory. So obedience to him is not just about following rules. It's about doing that which is most satisfying and most rewarding and most freeing and most useful for us as the people of God. In verses 50 and 51, we see the Israelites continue to act in obedience They not only heard what God commanded, but they followed through with what he said. The text says, all the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. If only that could be the story of the Israelites all throughout the Old Testament. He has been faithful to them. He heard their cries. He delivered them. So now as he leads them away, they can have full assurance that he will do good to them. Now, obedience is not always easy, but it is always right. 
You can imagine how some of the Israelites might have been thinking in this time. You know, this is all a bit dramatic. We've been living this way forever. Yes, it would be, it would be great to have more freedom, but maybe we can just work for change inside instead of, instead of uprooting our existence and moving out into the wilderness. That would, that would be easier, wouldn't it? The status quo is so tempting sometimes because it can be difficult to obey. Imagine what it would have been like to be someone like Noah. Remember in Genesis 6, 22, the Bible tells us Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. And imagine the ridicule he faced while he was building an ark in the middle of a world that had never seen rain. Yet his obedience stemmed from a deep remembrance of God's promise. He didn't just hear God. He acted on what he remembered, leading to salvation for him and his family. Remembrance of God's acts in the past and God's promises in the future are critical for our obedience. This is why God tells the Israelites here in verse 3, remember this day in which you came from Egypt. It's, it's unlikely that they realize just how significant that very day would be for the rest of human history. It is one of the most defining days in the entire story of the Bible. It is one of the most defining days in all redemptive history. And God is saying, remember it. And as you remember it, remember that God is a God who is worthy of our obedience because his plans for us do not include slavery and bondage, but liberty and true life. And, and with each act of obedience, we move further and further away from our past life of slavery to sin and the devil, and we dwell with greater confidence in the freedom given to us by God in the Lord Jesus Christ. So often we think of freedom or we think of liberty and, and we assume that means we throw off any restraint whatsoever. We, that means we can do whatever we want to do however we want to do it. But true freedom, brothers and sisters, true liberty, we learn, is to put ourselves in obedience to God. Because in God, obeying him, he is giving us what is best for us. We can remember what Paul teaches us in Galatians 5.1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. What is slavery? Slavery is doing what's right in your own eyes. Freedom is walking in obedience to God. And if you are in Christ, you are free. Why would you ever want to go back? Why would you ever allow the tyrant to rule over you again? You're a free man, you're a free woman in Christ, so why would you ever submit to a yoke of slavery again? It offers a whole lot of promises. It offers some fleeting pleasures and, and momentary good times, but it ends in shame and guilt and regret. It says, live it up, you only live once. But the writer of Hebrews reminds us, yes, you only live once, but you also die once. And after that comes the judgment. Instead of giving up true freedom for fleeting pleasures, the Apostle Paul urges us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, pleasing to God. This is spiritual worship. This is obedience. It's like the farmer who plants his seeds and waits trusting that one day it will yield a harvest. We too need the seeds of remembrance and obedience in our lives. It won't necessarily show growth tomorrow. Maybe by next week we might not think much has happened, but over a month or over, over three months, over a year, we start to see progress and we start to see that while it might not have been easy, to give in, to, to, to not give in to what the flesh desired, the hard way of obedience always, always, always results in a harvest of abundance that is well worth the wait. Another element of our obedience is found there in verse 8. Again, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Parents, we have a very important responsibility to pass our faith on to our children. 
What more could a Christian parent ever want than to know that their children are walking faithfully with the Lord? The salvation of our children is priceless, truly priceless. Their spiritual needs far outweigh any of their physical needs. They need our prayers. They need our our earnest prayers with hearts of flame, both for their, their initial repentance and coming to Christ by faith and for their life of ongoing faithfulness. Matthew Henry rightly declared that it is of far more value for parents who die to leave behind a treasury of prayers for their children than it is to leave behind a treasury of silver and gold. Just because you are a Christian is no guarantee that they will be. They do not share in the salvation that is promised to those who come to Christ by faith until they too are regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And so we need to pray for their salvation, for the salvation of our children. We need to call them to to trust in Jesus Christ as their only Savior. We need to teach them diligently, calling on them to remember what God has done and what God has promised. And, And teaching our children is not only a celebration of God's faithfulness, but is instructive of what it means to trust and obey the Lord. Remember in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul wrote about the sincere faith of Timothy that was first lived out by his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. Remembrance comes generation after generation, and it's through these generations that God most often grows his church. A 19th century Scottish preacher, Alexander White, prayed this, O Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, give us a seed right with Thee. O God, give us our children. A second time and by a far better birth, give us our children to be beside us in Thy holy covenant. Do you pray like that for your children? Christian parenting is an enterprise of faith. He also commands us to use the appointed means for, uh, for his, uh, to obtain his good gifts. And so we must pray for them. We must use those appointed means and, and teach them the scriptures and insist on their obedience as an act of obedience before God. We must see their salvation as the greatest thing in the world. Yes, we want our children to live happy and productive lives, absolutely. We want them to be successful in their endeavors, to have strong, healthy families of their own, but more than anything, we want them to behold Christ. And we, brothers and sisters, as their parents, are the means to that end. Teach them. Point out what God has done and is doing. Introduce them to other examples of faithfulness. Read biographies together. Surround them with other Christians in your home. Read the Bible together. Discuss Sunday school lessons and sermons around the kitchen table. Memorize the catechism and memorize scripture together. Serve in the church together. This is our greatest calling, parents. I... I, I bring my kids to school and they're surrounded by a bunch of parents who want nothing more than for their children to go off to an Ivy League school or to get the greatest career with the highest paying salary. They have all of these lofty goals for them and many of them without a single concern about their souls. What good is it to gain the whole world and your soul be cast to hell? This is our greatest calling. It's challenging. And yes, we are busy, we are tired, but you don't have many years until your little ones become big ones. So what are you doing with that time? Don't get so buried in the busyness of life and activities and forget to teach your children about our great God. Third and lastly, remember the Son of God. In verses one and two, God commands the Israelites to consecrate the firstborn of both humans and animals. And he repeats this command with greater clarity in an explanation in verses 11 through 16. And God is establishing a crucial principle of remembrance that is 
tied to sacrifice, is tied to God's deliverance. It is an act of redemption. It reminds the Israelites of their previous bondage in Egypt. And so the, the firstborn of ritually clean animals was devoted to the Lord, as were the firstborn males. The animals were brought to the tabernacle, or later on it would be to the temple, within a year from the eighth day after birth. This animal was sacrificed. Its blood was sprinkled on the altar. The meat was of, of, of the sacrificed animal was for the priests. The firstborn of unclean animals could be redeemed with an additional one-fifth of the value that was determined by the priests. And if not redeemed, these animals were to be sold, exchanged, or destroyed by the priests. The colt of a donkey was to be redeemed with a lamb. And if not redeemed, it was to be killed, and the meat from the unclean animal was not eaten. So many details. So many specific instructions from the Lord. Again, pointing back to this reality of God wanting us to worship him in the way that he wants us to worship him. But also showing us the, the significance of this element of the firstborn and the the cleanliness of the firstborn and why all of these things are in place to remind us that we need something even greater. If we go through all of these steps, if we have to find just this lamb and kill it in just this way and extract its blood and, and redeem it in all of these ways, and yet still it's not good enough, doesn't it cry out for something greater? All of this, year after year, indeed day after day, sacrifice is being made and they're just not good enough. We can't spill enough blood in all the world to be good enough. What will it be? Now as for the firstborn males in the family, they acted as priests in their father's absence or death. And this, this position of firstborn later ceased when the uh, priesthood was committed to the tribe of Levi. And all the firstborn of succeeding generations had to be redeemed at a price. And the redemption money became part of the Levites' yearly income. Now, of course, we know that the Lord Jesus is often referred to as the firstborn. In Colossians 1.15, Paul writes, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. It stresses Christ's right his preeminence as the eternal son of God. We can spill all this blood. We can eat this meal. We can do it all exactly as God has said, and yet it's not enough. What do we need? We need the firstborn of all creation. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the firstborn, Christ is the heir of all things. He is the head of his church. And so when God commands the Israelites to offer a sacrifice in the place of their firstborn, it serves as a powerful reminder of the cost of their deliverance. First in Egypt, but now more prominently and eternally in the Lord Jesus Christ. Something precious is given in exchange for what is rightfully God's. In Ephesians 1, 7, Paul writes, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Brothers and sisters, we have been redeemed at the greatest cost, paid by Jesus Christ on our behalf. While the Israelites were reminded that their firstborn were spared because of God's mercy, we are reminded that God did not spare his firstborn so that we could have everlasting life. We must remember the Son. And may it be that we respond with our lives, brothers and sisters. As we commune with God, we are led to greater obedience and greater love and greater worship and greater peace and greater hope and greater assurance, all because the firstborn of all creation has lived and died for us. Remember to commune with God. Remember to obey God. Remember the Son of God. Remember our great salvation. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, our great desire is that you would help us to remember. We truly long to commune with you in the ways that you have appointed that we might experience the great 
sweetness of drawing near to you and having a true experiential relationship with you. Lord, may it never be that our hearts are far from you while our heads are full. May it be, Lord, that all the truth that we understand from your word is appropriately worked into our hearts that we might continue to walk in faithfulness and obedience, that we might grow day by day by day, that as those seeds are planted, that in time the harvest would be magnificent. Lord, as you are transforming us day by day, making us all the more into the image of Christ, sanctifying us along the way, we pray, Lord, that while we may not see the growth from today to tomorrow, that in a year, in five years, in 10 years, we can look back and say, thank you, Lord, for where you have brought me. Thank you for what you have done. Because I remember where I was. I remember what Christ has done. I remember all along the way the the things that he has provided, the prayers that he has answered, the ways in which he did far greater and more abundantly than anything I could ever hope or imagine. Help us to remember you, O God. Help us to remember the Son. We ask that you do all of these things for your glory in your church. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please receive the benediction. Now the God who is from everlasting to everlasting, who has loved you with an everlasting love and gives you everlasting life, now support you with the everlasting arms in these days and all the days until Jesus comes again. Amen.